Nam 2019, David Mix Bus TV. I have the honor of having TLA with me. In the house. So glad to have you here. Happy to be here, <laughs> happy to be here. Man, if this is a big exclusive. We are at the Osburger uh, booth. And, yeah, their little soundproof booth, booth here. You get a little privacy and we get to sit down. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so I asked my audience what they wanted to know, you know, uh, some questions, drop some questions in the comments. So many were interested in your workflow, which is a little bit different than what we usually see and hear from other engineers. Do you want to talk about it a little bit? Yeah, well, I mean, first and foremost, I mean, I, 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 I work out of, um, my own studio, Spank Studios in Miami Beach, Florida. Right. You know, I have a, it's a studio that's in my house. Um, and it's kind of in a separate part of my house. So the good news is when I, when, I, when I shut the studio down and close the door, you know, it doesn't impede on my domicile, you know. So it's kind of like when the studio's closed, I don't feel like I'm living in a studio. Right, right. So that's great. And then when, obviously when I'm working, you know, and I have everything powered up, you know, I, I do my work. So I have a, an SSL 4000. Okay. It's a it's a 64 input console, so I kind of do a hybrid between um, working with a modern DAW, which I use Pro Tools, okay. um, and then summing that into my you know 64 channel SSL. Okay, so you do like let's say your first uh, main EQ on the board? No, so I use the console. Basically, I use the console. It's pretty much just a big summing amp. Okay, one. It's, I've worked my entire career on the 4000 series by, right. by SSL, so I'm just really used to that that setup, how the console's set up, where the monitors are in relationship to where I sit, you know, stupid little things like where the volume control is, you know, and for me to do stuff like soloing stuff, it's just so much easier to do it on a console. So I treat Pro Tools as if it's a, a tape, tape machine on right. steroids. Right. So my mixes are all plug-in based, except for one thing, except it's summed through the console. That is an uh, important message to give people. Yeah, so like, basically, I mean, look, what I do, you can do. You can totally do it. Um, because I get a lot of the, you know, oh, well, you have an SSL and blah, blah, blah. And I says, right, but this is how I use my SSL. So it's really, the audio comes in, again, just think of it, think of it being a 64 channel tape machine. Right. You know what I mean? Right. So pretty much if I can't and to be quite honest I really only use about 44 channels of the console so if I can't fit my mix on 44 channels of the console then I'm doing something wrong. Yeah, 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 yeah. you know what I mean but that's kind of how I do it so like pretty much 1 to 44 are my working channels okay and, and then again I would use the console let's say if I'm nearing the end of my mix and I just want to make a slight adjustment you know I can do it globally on that channel but anytime I'm really using any console equalization, it's usually on the drums. Mm -hmm. And again, it's usually not that much. It's usually just some finishing EQ. And then again, it sums through the SSL. And then I would be using whatever my compressor of choice is for my stereo bus compressor, okay. whether it be the SSL quad compressor that's right. built in the console, right. or it could be the Focusrite Red 3. It could be the Tube, tube Tech you know, stereo uh, limiter. Again, there, there's a multitude of stereo compressors. You know, and it all depends on the song how I'm feeling that day, you know, and maybe maybe I want to try something different. But yeah, the bulk of my work is all plug-in based using Pro Tools. But again, I'm coming out. So again, you know, my bass drum comes out on one channel. My snare drum comes out on another channel. My tom-toms come out on two channels, you know, and on and on and on. Absolutely. So again, more and more we, we are shifting towards that. I would say now pretty much we all are like, the bulk of our mixes is done on plugins. You know, yeah. For like, gigantic name like you yeah so I mean f again in my mixes you know with maybe 20 minutes of work I can take my mix and sum it in the box right you know what I mean if I want to hear what it sounds like it's literally just a matter of gaining everything down because remember now I'm gaining I'm I'm my my uh, my working levels for audio are to what the sweet spot is on the SSL exactly. so again my bass drum is going to be coming in at, at a maximum level Whereas if I had it to mix within the box, everything would be way too loud. So pretty much I've devised a setup and how I set up and begin my mix so that when and if I want to sum it in the box, it's really just a matter of about a six or eight dB gain drop of all the channels. And then to bring everything out one and two, put a bus compressor on there, boom, done. It's, uh, I've done so many videos about this, uh, gain staging. How, first of all, gain staging is different from in the box to where you use hardware gear or 
it, it, either hybrid or fully analog. So that's a, another important message for people. You can mix in the box, sure. you just you have to change your technique and, and how you gain stage things because yeah. it's not, you know. Oh no, absolutely. I mean, look, you know, I found for me in the 15 or 15 years I've been using Pro Tools, it might even be longer than that. You know, I found a method that works for me. Right. You know, for me, all my Pro Tool faders are zero because zero dB is really easy to remember. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I would make gain adjustments on the plugins themselves. Okay. So again, when I get sessions from people, you know, I see the guitars would be at minus 23.6, you know, and as you're working, if you bump something or change a level, how are you going to remember? God, was it minus 23.6 or minus 26.3? <laughs> Whereas zero is zero. Yeah. And if I need to make a gain adjustment, I just open up the, the, you know, pretty right. much whatever the last plugin in the window or whatever plugin is doing the gain control. Right. You know, I make the adjustment to that. So that kind of method works for me. And then if I need to do, or when I do automation in Pro Tools, using Pro Tools, I have 12 dB up, uh -huh. you know, and a million dB down. Right. You know, so generally, I'm not bringing anything up louder than 12 dB. That's uh, that's that's that's. I'm glad to hear that because I it's work just, exactly. It the just same. it just makes it for me. It makes it dummy proof. Yeah. Um, because I'm not that bright. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and the other thing with, within Pro Tools, you know, for me, when I glance at my session, one of one of the main things in Pro Tools for me is session management. It's being able to manage your session. It's difficult for you to get a great mix if you can't manage the session, if you're scrolling through pages and pages of stuff and it's written in hieroglyphics. Mm -hmm. It needs to be written in, in, in a way, at least for me, that's easy to see, that you can glance at, you know, and again, managing the session. So I don't I don't need to know that it's an SG number 2.1. <laughs> I need to know that it's the verse guitar. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Same. It's like real simple. Um, and then again, I let the plug-in do the work and then you're able to scroll through the sessions. And then I also turn off automation on all the channels when I begin my mix. And any channel that I'm going to have automation on, I obviously turn the automation on. Again, I can glance through my session and immediately know, oh, I see that this channel is in read, there must be automation written. Right. Whether it's a level move, whether it's a plug-in automation, whatever it is, I know that there's automation there. If the automation is turned off on that channel, I know that it's just a static level. I'm gonna steal. I'm gonna steal this. <laughs> right again. For me, it, it's, it's brilliant. It's yeah. dummy proof. You know. I, now look in Pro Tools Ultimate, they at least came up with you can hide. You can highlight the different plugin automations and it show you. You know, just by a, it's. It's. I believe that it's in yellow or whatever. It's. It's highlighted. It shows you if there's automated rip, But before that. There was no way of checking yes. except looking at that channel and seeing if there was automation written. So again, I've always kept it that if the automation is off, then I know there's no automation. If the automation is on, then I'm either doing some, I'm doing something with you. That is so really clever. Session though. session management is is, is very important. You can't get a great mix if you can't manage the session. Absolutely. And today we got mixes like mixes to do with like 200 tracks. So it's like yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, today we get what I call, and, and what my brother Chris calls, documents. They're, they're, it's not audio, it's a fucking document, it's excuse me, but it's a document that has no vibe, no soul, and the plugin, or the, you know, the plugin is doing all the work. So whether it's a distortion plugin, or an equalizer plugin, or a delay plugin, it's doing all the work. So, yeah, when you, when you have stuff like that, you know, I always tell, you know, engineers, it's, you know, there's, there's no reason you can't commit this, you know what I mean? Because again, chances are you're never going to change the way it is. So why not have it live that way for the rest of its life? You know, one of the things that, that we're going to be dealing with in the next decade is when they come out with new versions of these DAWs, they're not going to be compatible with what you have now. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be screwed when you go to try and open one of your old sessions, especially if, if you're using a DI guitar and all the effects are based on, on plugins. If you haven't recorded that stuff, you know, absolutely. You know, so you, they, you know, again, they have the you have the ability to commit it. You have the ability to keep the original channels. So why not just yeah, do exactly. that? Especially now that with Pro Tools finally got you know I got the commit function. That's the right. Print, right. That's you know, right. Why not do it? Right. Commit. You know, and again, so I mean, what I, what I I mean, again, so as a mixing engineer, you know, a lot of this stuff I'm getting it again. Luckily, like the distortion guitars stuff like that, you know, I obviously would get it that way. But again, you know, 
I do a lot of work with Japanese artists and I've been doing a lot of concerts. So what I do with the concert stuff is, I mean, again, I'll make comps, you know, I'll comp things and make it so that the session is magical. Right now, I'm in the process of mixing a band called One O'Clock and we recorded two shows with a 52 piece orchestra. Wow. So my session is literally a hundred gig yeah. of audio. So, <coughs> excuse me. <clears thros> The whole orchestra is, is mic'd separately. So in other words, I have 52 microphones of, of orchestra. So what I've done with that, I've, I've you know, sectioned them off. So here are the, here's the first violins, here are the second violins, here are the violas, here are the cellos. Balance, and I, cre I got a balance, and, and again, I made a commitment. So now, now instead of dealing with 50 tracks of strings, I'm really only dealing with six stereo pairs. I'm not six stereo pairs, four stereo yeah, pairs. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then I take the original data, you know, the original Story. microphones and all the bounce level. And I just created a new session with all that in it. And I've already had it gone back once or twice and I make adjustments right. for whatever particular song I'm working on. And then just recommit that one song and load it into my master session. But it makes the session very easy to manage. You know, and again, I'm not gonna be like, rarely am I going to change what that balance is. Right. You know what I mean? And the only time I had to go through and fix it was maybe a tuning issue. You know, maybe one of the string players, a couple of the string players were a little out of tune or something like that. And I would just fix it, you know, and I just re-import it in. But yeah, I mean, session session management is huge. I'm really happy we're talking about this instead of, uh, which is useful, talking about like what compressor, what plugins, or what chain for the vocals. <laughs> this is really important. This is like what you do, you're, prep, you're, you're prepping the session so that you can scroll through it and work with it easily. And it frees your mind from the technical stuff of what, what was the uh, correct you know, correct violin. so i mean again you gotta you know you have to set yourself up to succeed uh, yeah you know and this is for me is one of my ways so that i can set myself up to succeed because i mean again i'm not going to be able to get a great mix if i can't navigate a session you know so again you know in this particular song in this particular concert i'm doing you know i think there's upwards of 200 channels of audio you know you know, I think I have like 24 microphones that are just for ambience to pick up the, the audience. You know, so again, you know, once I have the balance set the way I want it, I will create maybe four or five stereo tracks based on where they are in the room, you know, and, and, and what type of delay. In other words, because obviously sound travels so slowly, you know, and I'll create a comp. And again, we have the ability to save the originals to store them in another session yeah. on a whole nother hard drive. And if you ever need to go back, you can, but your main mix session, it's nice and tidy, and now you're, you're able to focus on the important shit, and that's the song. Absolutely. Getting the song to sound great, doing whatever effects you want to do to it, you know, making it sound amazing, rather than just be like, oh, where the hell is that part again, as you're scrolling through five pages totally. of nonsense. Totally, and um, you mentioned automation. Uh, usually, let's let's talk just about volume automation, so right. You do them uh, at the beginning of your, of your song, or the beginning of the mix, or as a last step? Right, so for me, Obviously, I'm automating. I'm doing whatever I need to do as I'm working. Uh, yeah. So, but I try to get my mix to sound great with just static faders on my console. Mm -hmm. So again, as I'm working, you know, yeah, okay, this needs to come up a little bit like this chorus guitar. You know, so again, what I would do is if, if guitars are given to me as a single performance, I might split them up to here's the verse guitar, here's the B section guitar, here's the chorus guitars, so that a, I can manipulate them differently, and B, I can change their levels without having to put in automation. I also do the same thing with the vocal. But most of the time they come, you know, in most sessions yeah. I get, they come separate. Yeah, separate. So again, so again, I try to get it as close to the balance, as close as I can, the way that I want mm -hmm. it, you know, by letting the plugin do the work. And then again, as I'm working and getting closer to the finished version and seeing the bigger picture, then if I need to do automation, either within Pro Tools or on my SSL, okay. I'll do that. Uh, something that uh, happens to me while, while, I, while I mix, uh, when I do automation, I'm, I'm like with you, like whatever needs, whatever, whatever I need to do at the moment. So like it never ever happened to you that like something catches your attention and you need to fix it. Like some, some you know, we have our workflow. I don't know, I start with the drum, for example, then I go to the bass. Right, so, right, so. the same, 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 but same as me. Sometimes a, a, a mix uh, land on my desk and like that guitar or that vocal catches my attention, whether because I get an idea of what I want to do right. or because it needs fixing, so I do that first. That right. happens to you? Yeah, well, I mean, normally, like, 
you basically you fix it, you do things as you hear them. Yeah. Because what happens is, if you don't do it immediately, the first time you hear it, or the first time you hear an idea in your head, you forget about it. It's the first impression that is important. Yeah, it's, right? you always got to just... Keep, keep your... You know. Yeah, yeah. You know. Hopefully. You know, hopefully. you got to go with your first impression. That's and, part of mixing. Yeah. It's like, go with your gut, go with what your gut is telling Absolutely. you. And again, if you do it when it's in your head, you won't forget it and you'll, you know, again, you'll at least be able to walk down that road of whether it's a worthwhile thing to do. Totally. One thing that I adore about you is how versatile <coughs> you are. You, you go through genres like nobody else. You, you can mix orchestras and mensa, which we're going to talk about. You know. Yeah, I always jokingly refer to it as I, can, I, I mix anything from from Hanson to Manson and everything in between. Yeah. You know, so again, I mean, I did, did Manson at the time. They were a little teenage group with, with, with Bubblegum, you know, with Umbop, mm -hmm. which was a huge hit record. And then probably a couple years later, I think I did Marilyn Manson. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. so yeah, totally. Manson, Hanson to Manson and everything in between. It's it's funny because I've been mis mixing uh, rock and metal for my whole, my whole career and my old platinum album was hip hop. So like, <laughs> right. I can relate a little yeah, bit with yeah, that, you yeah. know? But uh, two questions, one question before going to, to the Manson album. Um, you mentioned a lot of tracks of ambient and uh, orchestra mic. Do you EQ individually those mics before comping? If needed, or you just balance yeah, them and yeah. then you EQ the stuff. No, each. So in the in the case of this orchestra show that I'm doing with One O'Clock, yeah. um, yes, each individual channel has its own individual EQ. So okay. how how I how how I treat it is I go okay. Here's the violin section. The violin section I believe is made up of ten violin players. Right. So I start with first chair. First chair is the main guy. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I start with first chair. I listen to what he's doing. I rough in whatever equalization I need for that. And then I pretty much just copy that over to the next channel. Okay. Make any adjustments to it, and it's more about getting the levels different. Because remember, we're doing. I did the recording, and we're trying to get a good recording with a, a lot of microphones in a quick amount of time. So some, you know, the first chair might not necessarily have been the loudest microphone when I recorded it. All that was concerned to me as I'm recording it is that everything's recording at a good level, and we're not clipping. So when I'm mixing it. First chair first, you know. Then I go to the next. I just copy the plug into the next microphone. If there's any equalization that needs to be different, I will do that, and I will also make level adjustments. All right. So my goal is to have each individual microphone the same level as the first player. Okay. Okay. And then again, just repeat. Then I listen to the whole section, and sometimes I'll take the first position player, put him in the center, and maybe make him three or four dB louder. Okay. Just so that there's a little definition of note. And if there's anybody you want to turn up, it's going to be the first chair. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's how I treated that. Absolutely. It's so interesting. You know, and then I would take that, send it out to a subgroup where I probably had another equalizer and just a little bit of compression on it. And again, and that's how I would do my commitment. So all yeah, those channels would go down a subgroup that probably had some finaling equalizer on it, equalization, a little bit of compression. And then from that, once I got the balance that I wanted, come in. Awesome. Manson, you mixed Mechanical Animal. I did mix Mechanical Animal. Which is one one of my, my biggest inspirations sound-wise, aside from the fact that I, that I love that era of Manson uh, musically, but, uh, oh my God, so many questions about that. <laughs> I know it was some time ago. Uh, two things, bass and vocals. The okay. bass on that record is insane. And yeah. I know Twiggy is a great musician, and is, is a musician that he really cares about his sound, like coming out from the amp. I would like to know, how much you changed that sound from, from where it came to you, if you remember what you used on it. Yes, yeah, so, okay, so Mechanical Animals. Mechanical Animals produced by Michael Beinhorn. Yeah. Michael Beinhorn has a, a, an interesting way of recording. So if memory serves me correctly, that was recorded on two inch 16 track. Wow. If, if memory serves me correctly, the, the, the rhythm section. So the drums, the bass, and probably the tracking guitars yeah. were, were, were recorded That's on 16 track analog. <laughs> um, if memory serves me correctly. So that, I believe that came in and we transferred that to, to at that time when I was mixing, I had a 3348 HR. So I took his analog tapes and transferred them to the, to the Sony 3348. So one of the tapes would have been a 16 track and I'm, I'm certain the other tape would have been a 24 track. Um, but yeah, I mean, if memory serves me correctly, that they were, you know, they were kind of thick analog recordings that, that were good to begin with, yeah. you know, and again, my job was just to make it, you know, a little bit better. Um, over the past year, I've actually been, been um, 
I've been uh, taking a look at some of those old multi tracks because I have those multi tracks. Oh my god! And, and uh, <laughs> one of the songs I did a modern mix on was "I Don't Like the Drugs, But the Drugs Like Me." Yes. You know where I actually did a plug-in <laughs> version, you know, like a plug-in mix of it. Oh, uh, yeah. Let me hear it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, of course I don't have it with me, but I have been. Yeah. Use, I did. I do use it for for mixing seminars, and I believe that I did it. Um, for the AES show, I used it. Oh this year at NAMM, I'm, I'm using some 41 uh, Fat Lip. But um, but I did a modern mix of, of I Don't Like the Drugs and the Drugs Like Me. And it's again, it's a completely plug-in based mix. And it sounds awesome. Oh, you know, right, and right. it actually sounds a little bit better than, than you know, I was, I was shocked. Because I mean, remember now, the EQ curve that we're using nowadays in 2019 and 2018 different. is different than what we used in 19, you know, 96 or 97, I believe, totally. when that record was made. Totally, and yeah, even gear changes because the style changes, change, you know, uh, like in metal nowadays we have rock and metal, we have a lot more bottom end that we use. That's right, to, that's know? right. So even the gear that we might, you know, used in the past might not fit today and we switch to something else. That's right. So, I mean, again, I, I do this because these are songs that guys like you, you know, and, and, and your audience grew up listening to. Oh, yeah. And I want them to see that it's really not the gear. Like, in other words, those were analog mixes that I did back in the day. But it's not the gear, it's your ear. Yeah. So, again, I can, I, can, I can do any mix in Pro Tools. You give me, you know, let me choose three EQ plugins, three compressors, and three reverbs. And I guarantee you, I can deliver the oh, same I'm mix sure. that I can deliver. You know, what happens is all these guys get hung up on the hundreds of plugins that they have, yeah. that they forget that they're all pretty similar. You know, I always tell my students, you know, master, yep. you know, pick a couple of plugins, pull everything out of your system, and just use a couple of plugins and master them. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's not the gear, it's your ear. Yeah. So look, I have an SSL because that's what I'm used to working on my entire career. It's more about where I sit, where the monitors are, where the volume control is. But, you know, when I was mixing analog, we only had 20 colors. You know, we had an LA3, we had an LA2, we had 1176s, <laughs> yeah. and a couple of other things, if you consider all the, the equipment to be colors. Now you have hundreds and thousands of colors with all these different plugins. So it can be overwhelming. And a lot of people have a hard time making a decision. So pick the ones that, that you like, that you know you can manipulate quickly, and the rest, you know, I have to have them because I, I need to open up sessions from other people. Of course. So I have to have every freaking plug-in known to man. And I have every plug-in known to man. You know, but again, in my mixes, you always see the same handful of plugins. Yeah, master them. Get, get, right, because you know, again, I want to be able to get the sound quickly. You don't want to labor over it. The only time you want to labor over something is if you're experimenting. Exactly. And trying to come up with something, you know, cool. I, I, I say that all the time, you know, and don't experiment, you know, unless you have time, you don't have a deadline. Exper experiment in your free time. You know, start right. not when you're mixing. When you're mixing, right. Right. you want to be well, fresh. Well, you, you don't experiment when the artist is in the room. Exactly. You know, <laughs> unless, the art is unless the artist is encouraging well, you yeah, to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but generally when the, or when, the, when the artist is in the room, you know, you want to get a, you want to have the chops to be able to get a great sound so that the artist can get a great performance. Because great sounds inspire great performances. Absolutely. Another question on Mechanic and Animals. There was that uh, it became kind of his signature sound right. that those uh, double vocals, which were very unique sounding, yes. especially in Mechanic and Animal. They started it with, with uh, Antichrist Superstar before, but it was really obvious on, on the album that yeah. we mixed. Yeah. Uh, do you remember if there were more uh, numerous, like multiple performances, or you did it on, in, in, in the back, um, was your... No, you know, well, I mean, on, on some of the songs have multiple performances, but, mm -hmm. but, but Manson's thing, again, it's real simple. It's kind of a throwback to Alice Cooper. So it's the two, even tied H910 harmonizer. Oh. So where you have, you know, one the left channel at 0.99 and the right channel at 1.01. Classic. Okay? And that's pretty that's much it? Manson's thing. Oh my god. Yeah, that's his sound. Was is the is the even tied, you know, harmonizer. Damn. So and again, <laughs> you just have one pan right, right, one pan left, you put that on his voice and it's boom, it's pretty much instant. Yeah. So, and you know, so that was that's the main effect on mechanical animals. That's awesome. Um, and on his sound. That's his sound, that's what he likes. 
And, and again, back there we were using, you know, hardware pieces. That's awesome. But it, it's as simple, I mean, again, as simple as that. That's great. And again, it's kind of a throwback to, you know, again, the old Alice Cooper records. That yeah. was kind of what yeah, was going yeah. on for that time. Yeah, which, which was one of his influence, as he said. Yeah, he yeah. No, and the cool thing about Mechanical Animals album, so, I mean, we would mix a song. I mean, so before I start the mix, Manson would come in, you know, we would discuss briefly what he was going for, and then he'd play me maybe two or three songs that are in a similar style. Okay. You know, and he goes, you know, he'd be like, I don't want you to copy this, I want you to be inspired uh, by it. By, yeah, of course. You know what I mean? So listen to this and then mix my song. That's you know? also and, and that's what that that's for the whole album, that's what, what he did. And it was very he's very, very smart guy. Yeah. You know, knew is. what he wanted, very talented, very, you know, able to verbalize mm -hmm. what he's looking for. And again, one of the only other artists, you know, I've only come across one other artist that did a similar thing, and that was when I mixed an album for Annie Lennox. Okay. Who, instead of playing the music, as she showed me a, 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 a series of visual images. Mm. She would show me visual images and I'd go, I'd like it to sound like this. Yeah. Okay? And yeah. Which I thought was, was very cool. It was very cool. I'm producing a hip hop artist right now, and the way he, he freestyles, he freestyled all, all the album. So the way he, he, he goes with me is like he plays me the beat, and, it, and he asks me, What you see? When he plays me, throw me random words. Right, 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 right. He right. gets inspired, go in, goes in the booth and start, you know, freestyling. Wow. The whole album That's like pretty that. cool. It's super cool. I yeah. want you to hear this guy. But uh, one last technical question. You uh, you, you said uh, you use your SSL as a, mix, as a summing mixer board. Yes. Pretty much. Uh, do you still rely on, do you still rely on uh, pushing it hard to the red? Well, yeah. I mean, so there's a sweet spot. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, Okay, I have this console. I want to utilize what it brings to the table. Right. You know. So yes, absolutely. I mean, my SSL. I, I mean, I've been working on it since the '80s. I know what the sweet spot is. Absolutely. You know, not not my console. I've had for 20 something years, but I've been working on that rev of console since the '80s. So I know where the sweet spot is. So of course, I make sure every day when I mix, I'm hitting that sweet spot. Yeah, totally. You know, because when you hit that sweet spot, it's all good. I. You know, and yeah, it does. It look. It it does add a nice you know, warmth to the sound, mm -hmm. but it's not the magic bullet. Yeah. It's not the gear, it's your ears. Yeah. So totally. manage your session, okay? And then master your plugins, yeah. master your DAW, you know? And then from there, it's all in here. It's just about getting what's in here to come out of your speakers. Trust your monitors and master your gear. That's my tip. This is the best interview ever. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, since we are in the Asperger room, what are your monitoring system right now at your studio? Well, I'd love to have these. I'm, I mixed on Aspergers for 15 yeah, years. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, at South Beach Studios, we had Aspergers. So obviously, I am a big fan. Absolutely. You know, yeah. Can't and this. Um, <laughs> I've been working on trying to get a pair. Yeah. How uh, about these these purple ones? They look. They're awesome. <laughs> they, they look great, but they sound even better. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, but but like like your, your viewers out there, I mean, again, I have modest monitors. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, my brother makes monitors, mm -hmm. you know, or has yeah. his name on monitors. So I'm, I'm curious to hear the, the CLA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so my brother's monitors, <laughs> Troy boy. <laughs> Troy Germano of the Hit Factory. Now runs oh, okay. the Germano Studios in, the, in the New York City. But, but, but Troy and I go, go way back. Yeah, so. we are at NAMM 2019, yeah, so guys. I'm, so like, I'm looking out the door and people, I see friends. Yeah, all friends. But yeah, but, but you know, again, I use you know I use the CLA tens, which are great monitors, um, and and the Barefoot MM 27s, which again are, are great monitors, and I also use IK Multimedia iLoud yeah. micro monitors. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know the micro mains, which are great monitors. You know, so none of my mixes go out without me checking it on each one of those sets of monitors. It, and I would love a set of Osbergers. Um, and I'll get them, just a matter of time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I get to use them at Bob's room or Echo Bar. They're amazing, yeah. they're amazing. They and uh, it also, it's important to, to say that you need to take time to learn your monitors, no matter what you get. Yeah, you gotta you know? trust them. You know, again, I always tell, I tell people, you know, start, Walk in each day if you're, if you're if you're not used to your monitoring, you know. Start each day, sit down in your chair, listen to something that you know sounds good. Yeah. It's called the point of reference. <laughs> so, listen to something that you know sounds good. Get that EQ curve in your head, then start your session. Absolutely, Tom. Happy mixing. Thank you so much for this. It was a pleasure. Thank you. To be Thank here you. with you.
and uh, I hope to see you soon. Yeah, man. <laughs> Thanks again. Mixbus TV, Tom Lord Alge, NAM 2019. Rock on.